So first question, can you introduce yourself? Can I introduce myself? Yeah. I'm, I'm Audrey Tang, Taiwan's Digital Minister in charge of social innovation, open government and youth engagement. So most of the people, when uh, we are talking to the people uh, about you, they say, ah, the digital woman, what do you think of this expression? Uh, well, it means that I've got my message across, the, that the digital ministry, and the uh, digital ministry because uh, before me, there was no such a title. Uh, so being the first digital ministry is just to get people's idea about digital as different from, say, ICT, which is uh, information communication technologies. ICT enables the digital, but it's not the digital. The digital is the application of ICT technologies toward a new social configuration. So Taiwan is one of the first country, maybe the first country who create a digital minister. What does it say and what does it mean? So um, the digital minister says uh, that we have uh, the need of engaging people in a different way in a political context. Whereas before, people mostly acted through the representatives, uh, through real world meetings and assemblies, which has this physical constraint, uh, just the room size and the fact that only one person can speak at the same time. But now using digital methodologies, such as Slido actually, uh, everybody participating in the Brian show, uh, thousands of them can vote on the most uh, wanted question to be answered by me, which is about my hair for some reason. But in any case, that is the idea of a what we call crowdsourcing, meaning that people can listen to one another's ideas and improve on each other's idea. And this says that the democracy itself is a technology and that it could be improved uh, by promoting it from being the analog world only into a digital plus analog world uh, version. So that is uh, what to me the connection of the word digital to the word minister means. What do you mean? Democracy is a technology. Mm -hmm. Democracy is a set of technologies, of course. Going into the uh, voting booth is a technology. You use the technological component, that is the ballot, the voting box, uh, the screen, and things like that. Uh, and so this technology together enables collective decision making in a, um, you know, every four years, every two years, or whatever basis. But the way to make such processes and arrangements is by self-designed. Self whether we have referendum in the same year as the election or not, whether we have the threshold of referenda set to some level of the population, whether we enable day-to-day -day participation instead of just every once, um, every year, every two years, we have the continuous uh, participatory budgeting and petition and things like that. All these are mechanisms designed to be better reflect the actuality of the policy that what people perceive the world is and also what the common problems are and what common solutions are and uh, to increase the bandwidth, that is to say the available inputs into the collective decision making by everybody. How can this technology can help Taiwanese people who are uh, in fact the prisoner of two camps, the blue one and the green one? How this democracy and this technology uh, can help them to, to quit this uh, uh, dichotomic world? One hand the blue and the second hand the green. How can we go outside this uh, um, this, uh, this model. Hmm. So as of how to um, get out of the binary blue or green uh, camps uh, in the Taiwan citizenry, um, when I entered the cabinet and filed my HR uh, form, um, people generally know that uh, there's two fields. One is party affiliation and one is gender. And I filled in none to each of them, uh, symbolizing that one need not to choose uh, in a kind of binary yes or no, man or woman, blue or green version, but can rather emphasize uh, the idea of transculturality, um, the trans and transgender, means transition, meaning that you can grow up in a camp, but move to another camp to learn their culture, their lineages, their languages, and view where you grow up from using the lens of a new culture. And you can keep doing so. In fact, Taiwan has more than 20 national languages, so each one is a different cultural lineage. So the more that you learn about those national languages and cultures, the more you become transcultural, meaning that you form your own self-identity out of constellation of different lineages. And when more and more people do so, we have a much more diverse and transcultural citizens' republic. That's why you accept to, to work with this government, not for this government, but uh, as you said, 
uh, for with this government because you are uh, the first transgender minister all over the world. The first. Um, so um, the question was uh, whether I'm a first uh, transgender uh, minister in the world, the first openly transgender minister in the world. What, what, do you, what is the difference? Um, meaning that I'm open about it. Mm -hmm. But there could be transgender people that pass very well and did not want to go open about it. And they may be ministers, we don't know about it. Mm -hmm. So let's start from the beginning. Your first step in politics was with the Internet Engineering Task Force. Can you explain to me uh, the origin of your uh, steps in, sp in politics? So the question was uh, whether my experience with the standards making um, semi-organizations uh, like the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, or the W3C, the World Web Consortium, and so on, uh, informed my political understanding. Um, so I participated in the free software movement, uh, in particular the Pro language, which was the what we call people's um, language of choice to glue the wild web together because at the beginning of wild web every uh, website that offers dynamic context uh, to what people are visiting in a kind of personalized fashion most of which do it through the pro language and so there's a vibrant ecosystem of people contributing uh, to make for example the various automated translations between languages uh, on the wild web uh, to write web search engines and web crawlers and things like that and all this were uh, done in a very open innovation ecosystem now there need to be certain rules uh, for those um, browsers and for those spiders right if I have a, a website that I don't want certain part of it to be scraped uh, by those robots but I want human to be still able to view it there need to be a well agreed way like robots.txt that teaches all the web robots to first read that and understand that that there are certain parts meant for humans uh, but not for central engines or robots and that is a protocol that has no legal binding uh, power uh, backed by a army or something like that but it is just by mutual understanding that if we all respect this norm and codify it as a request for comment, uh, meaning a document that requests everybody's comments uh, through this collaborative working group participation, it makes the web much higher value for everybody involved because people can feel much more secure. And this is a kind of a common value out of those different positions, be it browser developers or other kinds of developers. And so because of this, the IETF and the W3C are set up to be what we call multi-stakeholder, meaning that anybody who can show that they have a stake in this discussion with an email account they can participate in the rulemaking and that is the kind of political tradition that I joined since I was 14 years old. It was the beginning of, uh, the, go, uh, of the concept of uh, go, uh, go, some, go Zero. Uh, you mean you, you, you create uh, the, the concept of uh, fork the government. What, what, what does it mean? Can you explain to me? So the question about forking the government, uh, which is one of the main Go Zero uh, slogans, um, is to uh, look at how software is being developed nowadays. Very few people write a complete system from scratch. They usually look at an existing system. For example, uh, in Microsoft Windows, the main browser now, called Edge, uh, is a browser that is a fork of the Google browser, Chrome. They share the same open source projects, uh, Chromium, uh, which has its development mostly by the Chrome uh, browser. But Microsoft took that browser and rebranded it and developed a few different functions, but still share mostly the common, uh, what we call a code base. And so Edge, Microsoft Edge, is a fork of the Chrome Chromium project. And so this implies two things. First, it is not purely competitive. Microsoft wouldn't want the Chrome project to wither because they share significant code bases. So it's not purely destructive competition. But then it is healthy competition because when Microsoft contribute into their fork and if it's a very good idea, then the Chrome browser may also merge back those ideas into the Chrome browser so that the good ideas being prototyped in various diverse user populations may end up informing one another and to a, a better browsing experience for everybody. And so forking and merging uh, kind of imply one another. Forking meaning taking an alternative route, explore a different possibility, which may or may not work. And then merging means, oh, it gained mainstream acceptance, and then the mainline want to merge it back, so that it becomes the commonality for every other new forks from this time forward. So forking the government, what? what? So, 
So because of that, the GovZero uh, website, g0v.tw, is a intentional fork of the public government website, gov.tw. The idea is that for each government website and services, which is usually something that gov.tw, there could be a forked version of that website uh, at the same website address, but just changing an O to a zero. So without spending any budget on advertisement, people can just simply change an O to a zero from a government website and get into this kind of shadow government that is a forked version offering very similar services. The first one being the uh, more visualized way to communicate the budget, uh, how the budget increases, decreases, and enable a conversation. But they relinquish the copyright in the national budget visualization so that by the time that the national budget uh, office think, oh, it's a really good idea, they can work with the National Development Council to incorporate that design of the citizen's budget visualization from a GovZero design into a real gov.tw. Uh, website. So now in join.gov.tw, you can actually see the inaugural GovZero pro project of budget visualization now being made part of the government offering. And so that is the merge of the fork of trying a different way to visualize budgets. So what is the aim of, of that? Uh, what is the aim for the Taiwanese people? And what, what will be the consequences for the Taiwanese people, the people like you? Uh, like every citizen. So the aim of uh, civic technology um, is to build new ways of engagement so that people can understand where shared responsibility in this political context that if we face a global problem or a domestic problem that uh, inflicts um, its structural issues on each of us, we can only make structural changes if everybody are on the same map that everybody understand the how national budget is made, how those items are distributed, and if they are willing to engage a conversation, a real conversation, with career public service about those budget items. Only then can they develop informed opinions and then informed suggestions on how to solve the problem in a way that is previously unimagined. Otherwise, it could be a very innovative but it's not based on a shared common reality and therefore harder for people to adopt it as a public policy. Do you consider yourself as an activist, activist with a H, uh, A, C, like hackers, but activist inside these organizations, inside the government? So whether I consider myself as a hacktivist, well, I'm certainly more of a hacktivist than a collectivist. A clicktivist is somebody who only press like, uh, but did not translate that like into other actions. Um, but that is still entry level, very important, is to raise awareness. But what we are doing then is in the government creating a way for the citizens to not only press like every four years, which is called voting, by the way, uh, for the leading candidates, but press more likes in terms of raising petitions, in terms of raising more crowdsourced agenda for public discussion and creating um, the context to inform more people to build such a crowdsourced platform. And what we are doing here can be considered hacktivism if you think of hacktivist as a kind of civic hacking in that making sure that people understand that our current civic system, including the democratic process, is a system that you can offer your insight and make changes for the better. So it's definitely white hat and not black hat hacking of the democratic system. That's why it was important to, to make a kind of hacking of the democracy because the democracy was, was sick of what? What was the sickness of this democracy? Well, first of all, hackers, uh, civic hackers, I mean, the reason why civic hackers understand a system and make changes to it is not necessarily to fix anything. It is mostly out of a curiosity and a shared collective mission to make common values out of different positions. And that is the true drive of civic hacking. It is to understand the society more. And through this understanding, also understand ourselves more because we are also products of the society that produces us. And so in this kind of um, mutual common understanding between the various different cultural lineages comes the idea of civic hacking that is inclusive instead of just people writing 
computer code. It could be people writing legal code. It could be people uh, studying the way of storytelling. It could be people making visual arts that shows alternate possibilities and so on. And so this kind of inclusive civic hacking is no longer restrained into this computer. Uh, like we see a broken computer, we fix a broken computer, a kind of mechanistic thinking. This is more about a diverse population wishing to do what we call social production, making social objects that allow us to understand our own culture and each other's culture better. But the first time when we, we talked each other two years ago, you told me that uh, uh, this democracy uh, was suffering of uh, apathic. Uh, the, the risk of this democracy was to become an apathic democracy. democracy. So last time we talked, I was observing that all around the world, the people are not engaging with the democratic process as much as they used to. Maybe their attention or their time is more um, captured by the more instant gratification kind of social media. And this is a global phenomenon. And in Taiwan, this is less pronounced because we're a younger democracy. And also people feel very strongly about the democratic process. So we don't yet see a dwindling kind of uh, attention span or apathy toward politics and toward democracy as much as other more developed uh, republics and democracies with longer traditions. But what we are doing in Taiwan, the civic hacking and the democratic in innovations can certainly be applied by those older republics and democracies in a way to kind of cure this apathy to democracy. That's why I didn't... Uh, so in uh, 2014, uh, the Sunflower Movement uh, arise, uh, but you didn't want to participate to this uh, movement directly. Uh, you were not with this uh, young generation of, uh, um, of political activists, but you helped them. How did you, why did, didn't you participate directly to this movement and how you helped them? So um, back in the Sunflower Movement, um, the GovZero channel was simply asking for people who are versed in live streaming to help reporting a live streaming context of the people who are against the sudden passing of the Cross-Strait Service and Trade Agreement, or the CSSTA. Uh, so at a time when I uh, bring my equipments uh, to the protest, I didn't know that they're going to occupy. Uh, that was not a information shared with people in the street. Um, actually, only a very few people understand that they are going to break and enter the parliament. And so when I offered my phone at a time as a kind of hotspot to connect the um, HSDPA uh, signal uh, for live streaming, I thought that I could get my phone back the next morning. Uh, but actually, um, the phone was just stationed there for the next 22 days. And so because of that, <laughs> that is uh, the context of the Sunflower Movement, is that there's a lot of people who are very much intentional in getting the right message out, in that when they are indeed breaking and entering, there was no violence, confrontation with the police. There was almost no police uh, stationed there, and that uh, they were not uh, kind of vandalizing uh, as some of the uh, media try to portray, uh, or they're not mobs and so on. They're actually very intentional in setting up a demonstration. Uh, and their, their theory is that the MPs were on strike, so we do their job for them because we kind of elect them to do this job. So anyway, so the idea here is that we're here to support, but I wasn't aware that they're going to occupy. Uh, but uh, the fact that uh, you said that uh, Taiwanese democracy is very young democracy. Uh, people care a lot. Mm -hmm. Sorry? And people care a lot about democracy. Yeah. But it's a young democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that there is a conflict between two generations of people here? In one hand, the young people who did this uh, Sunflower movement and the uh, generation of their parents, for example, or their grandparents, who, who lived under the, the martial law. Is there a conflict and, and is it a danger for this democracy that uh, those two kind of generations fight each other and it can stop the democracy to, to, go, to go ahead? So the question is that whether the democracy itself, while being so young, um, can create, by participating in the democratic process, a divide between generations and specifically three generations. Uh, my generation is the last one that remembers the martial law. 
people younger than me have no idea what martial law is. And the people above my generation, like my father's generation, they are the generation that's protested, much like people in Hong Kong now, uh, against the martial law and eventually democratized uh, Taiwan. And the generation before my dad, my grandma's generation, well, that was under Japanese rule. And my grandma's first language is Japanese. Uh, and so that is a very different, certainly not democratic, as a kind of colonizing uh, culture uh, that she was raised in. So um, I would say, though, for all the four generations that I talked about, democracy is a shared value. Various generations under very different colonizing martial law just lifting out of martial law, now deep, inclusive democracy and globalization. These four different contexts, people all tried in various ways to get the freedom of speech, of expression, of assembly. And this is the kind of value that unites the different generations together. The particular ways of getting the democratic process, of course, differ. Because as more tools become available, people's imagination gets widened. People thought of referenda as something that is monumental and constitutional in my father's generation. But now, referenda is being used in more like solving day-to-day -day issues that concern the entire society, such as, say, energy policy. And so because of that, the techniques and the instruments have different generational interpretations. And it's true that people who have different lived-in experiences around, say, same-sex marriage um, disagree with each other of what marriage means uh, in a referenda. But both sides agree and promote the idea of referenda as a democratic innovation. That's my point. Yes, but in the same time, in this society, I feel that there is a big uh, gap between two kinds of people. Uh, uh, the people who want to be uh, independent because Taiwan is a country de facto, and uh, on the other side, people who are afraid of China and they want to have a uh, uh, a big, uh, a, a good relationship with China, right? Because they are afraid of I don't know what, but uh, uh, this is the, a new division, or because you were talking about the, those four generation of people who have the same value and the same feeling for democracy. But in the other hand, we feel that the choice now today for the Taiwanese people is money or freedom. What do you think of that? So as for the question about whether that uh, maintaining um, the sovereignty, uh, which is the base of the democratic innovations, uh, is somehow um, controversial if one wants to make more economic ties uh, with the PRC. That was the question, right? Um, but in fact, the economic communications and cultural exchange with PRC have not slowed down. It is true that in the past few years, the more and more Taiwanese people thought that uh, our democratic process is not up for people in the PRC territories to decide. However, they're still open for economic and cultural exchanges with the PRC. It's not a zero-sum game, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, and also, there's people who think um, that people in Hong Kong is going through a very similar process in like, Taiwan's early democratization in that uh, a more liberal democratic people, uh, after a large protest, is now actually helping to run their community level policy development. And there's a lot of it in the early kind of community development era in Taiwan, where we have lifted the martial law, but have not yet voted for the president, where the civil society, the social sector, grew in its legitimacy. And this community building um, process it reinforces the democratic culture that then informed the presidential elections and so on after 1996. And so there's more and more people who think this is a valuable lesson that people in Hong Kong or people around our region, everybody can learn from Taiwan's experiences and Taiwan can help in that. And so this is the other way, right? This is not afraid of a external culture somehow influencing Taiwan so that we regress to be more authoritarian. This is rather we becoming more democratic and have innovations that are readily applicable and then spreading these innovations across the region so that everybody in this region have a hope that the democratic innovations is not counter to the Asian values.
what do you think uh, 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 of the fact that uh, uh, a woman like Annette Lou, for example, <laughs> uh, chose to, to, to quit the DPP because she wanted to, to be with uh, uh, the same idea of uh, for, uh, Alliance Formosa to, because she wanted to claim the, the, the independence of, uh, of Taiwan and change the name of Taiwan because the identity of Taiwanese people today is to be Taiwanese because they are democratic, they have democratic change values. Change the name of Taiwan to what? To Taiwan? To, 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 uh, uh, no, to change the name of Republic of China. Ah, okay, of ROC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> of ROC in, into Taiwan. It mm -hmm. means that, okay, now uh, our history with mainland China is over. We, mm -hmm. we choose democratic mm -hmm. values, so we are not Chinese mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What do you think of mm -hmm. this? Well, my name used to be Archie's tongue, so I mean, name change, uh, you know, been there, done that. Uh, but in any case, what I'm trying to say is that um, everybody have their freedom of expression here, uh, and all the political parties centering around this idea. There's many, many ideas of which uh, that we see the uh, citizens when they're voting on the party ticket they chose, right? So the various different parties which. Uh, represents maybe more than a dozen different imagination to that question of uh, the naming uh, issue. Um, they have published it on their um, public um, forums and the policy forums and the way that people voted uh, currently says that most people are happy with the idea that of a uh, Taiwan ROC um, or ROC uh, left parenthesis Taiwan right parenthesis but you don't pronounce the parenthesis so it's just ROC Taiwan and to me ROC by the way means the Republic of Citizens let's go back to the sunflower movement the fact that this movement was the first streaming revolution Pardon? The fact that uh, the Sunflower Movement was the first streaming revolution, what does it say about Taiwanese democracy? There's a lot other, like, you know, the Arab Spring that was live streamed, so... Um. Yes, but it was the first one in... Oh, uh, in Taiwan? Yes. Ah, okay, sure. Um, okay, so about the role of live streaming played uh, in the Sunflower Movement, I think live streaming uh, drastically um, lowered the participation cost because people, even if they are in like very far other countries, many time zones, far removed from Taiwan, if they care about the Occupy, they can participate in the Occupy. For live streaming is a bi-directional device. When people dial in to live streaming, and there were many live stream stations, each talking about one particular aspect of the CSSTA. So maybe some people care about, say, allowing telecom components from the PRC to offer telecom services in the new, at that time, 4G network. There's many people care about this, but they don't have to physically travel to Taipei. They could be anywhere in the world and yet participate in the discussion and contribute meaningfully to the rough consensus of people, which, by the way, is that we disallow PRC components in the core 4G infrastructure at the time. Uh, because of that, the participation rate um, is grows exponentially because the more people participate, the more that they see their ideas become the agenda that is discussed by the occupiers, the more they will want to kind of water that garden <laughs> to spend more time, more attention uh, in the Occupy process. And you see very similar dynamics at play in Hong Kong too. Can you, uh, can, can you explain to us uh, how uh, this uh, Sunflower Movement began? Because how could the people imagine that they could vote uh, a, a law like that with no protestation? Uh, some people we met said that uh, uh, for the old generation of Taiwanese people who used to live I I under the martial law, uh, Taiwan became the little dragon, you know. Uh, everything was made in Taiwan. In France, for example, my, my, when I was a kid, my clothes and my, my toys was made in Taiwan. And when the democracy arise, uh, they say, oh, we lost everything. Uh, because the, the workers are paid more. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> uh -huh. there is all, uh, this new division between people who think that under the martial law it was good because the economic 
uh, was good, and with the, the and democracy is a synonym of uh, the, the a bad economy. Mm -hmm. So, I'm not sure whether it's a question or just a statement that I'm asked to comment. Though. Yes. Uh, okay. Right. Yeah. So I can't re rephrase that question. Um, so quoting the statement that somehow the days and economy during the martial laws are better and uh, days in the democracy, although a lot of innovation did not result in better economy, unquote. Um, for that statement, I have two answers. First, during the martial law, there was no freedom of the press. So anything that reflects a bad economy or a natural disaster or whatever is systemically dialed down and indeed censored. So people don't see the bad news, literally, because nobody writes bad news during the martial law. And so obviously, if all you read is good news from the state propaganda unit, it's easy to think that there's a lot of social um, harmony going on. Uh, however, after democracy, it's true that many people feel that suddenly it becomes very chaotic and people have a lot of different voices and some strange and some outright wrong from their perspective. But that is how Taiwan can innovate. You cannot innovate from a streamlined, from a kind of uh, cookie cutter mindset. For Taiwan to have our contributions in the film world, in the design world, uh, in making um, innovative software and hardware products, uh, in all sorts of these innovations, it's essential to have people think different. And so this idea of a linear GDP growth seems to be the only number that we're looking at when we're doing policy. Now we more say that the World Economic Forum ranks Taiwan as one of the four super innovators in the world that were the most innovative people, even though that the GDP linear growth um, uh, is of course because we're now a developed country in the WTO, not as fast as people who start from the lower uh, baselines, that's true. And so I would say that the statement is based on fact, but it is indeed a value choice. And that one chose diversity and innovation when we did our democratization. You, you, you think that China is not uh uh, is not an innovative country? So uh, the question was uh, why did the WEF not choose PRC as one of the super innovators? Why did they choose say Switzerland or Germany uh, or some other countries? Um, well I think that WEF mostly look at like new ideas being produced not a efficient implementation of existing ideas. So there really is no kind of bad or good or that some innovation is good and implementation is bad or that creativity is good or efficacy is bad. Uh, no, th these are of course all good things. What I'm trying to say is that every jurisdiction have its own prioritized values and Taiwan, because we're a liberal democracy, come to prioritize innovation over linear growth and we also prioritize inclusiveness. Uh, like people have to take care of each other's education and broadband access and things like that instead of just linear growth in the large cities and things like that. So let's talk about uh, the fact that you define yourself as an anarchist. Conservative, conservative anarchist. Conservative yes. anarchist. Mm -hmm. What does it mean? Mm -hmm. So a conservative is someone who respects and conserves cultural traditions. As I said, in Taiwan there's more than 20 different national languages, each representing one or more cultural lineages. So while a progressive trained in one culture may drive process of improving the progress according to that culture, that may sometimes have an effect that makes the other culture less um, commonly known or less visible so that it may look like progressive, but to the other cultures involved, that is not uh, progress, that is actually uh, just absorption or um, augmentation or adaptation, but it all ends in absorption. So that is uh, the kind of uh, way that we're not going. What well, we're going, instead of like uh, monoculturalism or silo multiculturalism, where each culture is in safely in its own enclave, 
what we're going for is transculturalism, where people can easily travel across cultures and their own identities too. And what this means in a conservative sense is not just to keep the culture as is, but to make sure that people get exposed as much as they want to the various cultures so we can make new cultures in a transcultural way. And that ties to the innovation culture that I just talked to you about. Now the anarchist part means that we're not uh, having one culture dominate the other cultures through the use of coercion, the use of commands, the use of uh, physical or other kinds of violence. Rather, we want those different cultures to go about their ways in a way that respects their diversity and do so in a way that is more like a cooperative or at least collaborative relationship instead of a dominating or colonizing uh, perspective. But uh, it, it, it can be seen as a contradiction to be an anarchist and to work inside a government mm -hmm. because mo usually we say that anarchists have no god and no master. So I don't have a master either. No. But it, it, do you see uh, people who say to you, it's a contradiction, you can't be anarchist? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was having a sense of deja vu because mm. Brian asked that question. Ah. <laughs> Better than, than Brian. Brian. <laughs> 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 I bought the t-shirt. <laughs> okay. I'm going to bring it to France. Oh, awesome. Yeah, Brian, I think, speaks excellent French as well. Yeah. Oh, uh, actually, that was the cosmetic. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. she, she, right. she, she was uh -huh. speaking very. She is a friend of uh, Ines. Oh, really? Harper. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, because I was just, you know, uh, my eyes were, were closed and, and moved in various ways, but I just keep hearing this very eloquent <laughs> <laughs> French speaking voice. <laughs> and when you said, don't, don't ask questions because it's uh, disturbing the, 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 the ministry. Yeah, yeah, and she said, yes, you're right. <laughs> Oh, that's very funny. <laughs> So let's talk about this uh, possible contradiction to be an anarchist and working inside a government. Mm -hmm. So um, the idea of a state of anarchy, which means simply that nobody is at charge and possibly chaos, and the philosophical idea of anarchism which is rejecting authorities and rejecting hierarchies um, is actually two different things. And I think it's uh, important to distinguish between the two. I'm not for like randomly destroying things uh, to have a state of anarchy. I'm trying to say that we can get about governing through multi-stakeholderism so that there is governance, but we don't rely on the direct command and order structure hierarchies to do this governance. So collaborative governance or COGOV is in fact compatible with anarchistic principles. So let's talk uh, about uh, what are you doing uh, um, as uh, inside uh, your digital minister. Um, what is your, your task here? Is it uh, to create a free dialogue between the civil society and the civil servant and why was important to create that and what is the problem between the civil society and the civil servant in Taiwan? Mm -hmm. So my work as a digital minister is first to show that a government is not a black box 
that it is in fact a fact that we have a lot of mechanisms, many of which described in law, but a lot of which is just norm within the public sector. But people who don't work in the administration, they don't have visibility in the machinery, that is the public administration apparatus. And so they often attribute uh, individual ministers' um, ideas as uh, the cause to whatever structural deficiencies that they're perceiving the administration to do. And so what I'm trying to show here is that if we can have the career public service have more direct conversation with people in a more effective way, they can also sympathize with the people more so the government can trust the citizens more. And why the government trusts the citizens more? By being more transparent and accountable. Some citizens will want to participate because whatever they offer, they can see how it's translated into real policy. And the problem of the previous generations of democracy was that it doesn't scale. If you invite, say, 20 experts to form a focus group or a panel, maybe they can produce something useful. But if you invite 20,000 people into your city hall, then they, it's very difficult for them to produce something useful. Unless, of course, you design process around deliberation. And so the design of deliberation process, which predates the social media, is getting a boon by the social media by getting more people's part-time participation in a deliberative process. Previously, people thought that they have to spend entire days uh, just sitting in citizens' assembly and reading materials and things like that. Very few people, uh, in percentage-wise, would want to do that. So maybe you do sortition and maybe you statistically make your volunteers representative uh, and things like that. But now, if people can participate in part-time, just spending five minutes or ten minutes, but uh, add on this idea of social media getting people's attention toward the same problem, then the actual hours added together actually exceeds that of the face-to-face -face consultation. And so it can then inform the face-to-face -face consultation to happen with a much more clear picture of what people discover into this problem space and the possible solution space then also grows for the face-to-face -face deliberation. So this is not to remove or replace face-to-face -face consultative meetings. This is rather to make it much more informed by crowdsourcing the agenda of such consultations. How can you explain that in the 90s the, in the, 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 the institution changed a lot in Taiwan with the democratic process? but not the institutional culture. Why uh, institutional culture and institution didn't change uh, together? So the question was, why did uh, uh, institutional, like the process, the uh, rule of law and so on, uh, and election of the president and so on changes? But the uh, culture, for example, that was built during uh, martial law that is still very authoritarian didn't change immediately with it. Well, because culture change takes time. Culture is, in essence, a set of norms and habits, and it's hard to change habits. Uh, and so while you can uh, appoint a um, prime minister that want to be uh, democratic uh, and engage in people in a way that listens truly to their voices and so on, the people did not really have a first-hand experience of such constructive deliberation and therefore they would still act habitually and correctly under martial law in a more um, authoritarian fashion of like power struggle and things like that. And so that is important to understand that whatever habits evolved during the martial law, many of which are still here with us, in each of us, like I'm one of the generation that remember the martial law. So I still remember the kind of self-censorship one can feel if you write something that may not um, you know, be appealing to the central government's censors. And if you have this kind of self-censorship long after free freedom of speech, long after the press freedom is granted, long after uh, that the Minister of Culture no longer controls any press whatsoever, people can still act as if they're being watched by the censors. And that habits change very uh, slowly.
do you think that today, uh, because uh, the, 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 the democratic process started with the end of the martial law in 1987, uh, more than 20 years, uh, more than 40 years after, do you think that uh, the civil servant today in the... the, the, the more than 40 years? Uh, 38 years, sorry. <laughs> okay. More than 30, 30 years. years. So almost, some 30 years almost later. 40 years yeah. later. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the civil servant uh, uh, have always this those habit of uh, self censorship? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So so uh, the question was um, like for 30 some years since the lifting of the martial law. Um, have not the public service changed in its culture? Well, almost by definition, people who are working in the public service, if their age is under 35, then they don't remember the martial law, period. And of course, they're much more liberal and much more inventive and innovative. But it's also true that people in the public service are not universally under 35 years old. And so there are still a lot of people, some in senior positions, some in junior positions, uh, that are still constrained by the martial law indoctrination when they were very young. And, and that is just a fact that we're living with. Do, don't you think that there is a, a danger uh, to create a total democracy, a total transparency? Uh, don't you think that it can be a danger for uh, the democracy itself? It would be totalitarian, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Okay, can you say that? Oh, okay, okay. So, um, I'm not for the idea of, say, total transparency. If you take it to the logical extreme, that I live stream everything that I see every day, that people literally uh, watch the world through my eyes for some reason, uh, there will remain no privacy for anyone who I encounter it with. And that will be indeed like some bad episode from Black Mirror, right? Uh, but I'm not advocating for that. I'm advocating for radical transparency, where radical means at the root. So whenever a decision is being made with me as the chair, we make a transcript so that people understand that whatever they say that has binding power will be published in context. However, everybody gets 10 working days to work through their messages and removing, say, uh, privacy concerns or removing, say, that anecdotal quotes that they quoted from other people that they don't want or they didn't ever give consent to uh, spread to the public and so on. But the thing is that it's public by default. So it takes some effort, not a lot, but some effort to censor parts of the issues that concerns, say, trade secret or privacy that uh, don't uh, necessarily go out. And so this process means that open is the default. And that is what I mean by radical. But it's certainly not total transparency. How can you explain that uh, Tsai Ing-wen administration wanted you to create this digital minister? Because those people belong to those generation who lived, who knew the martial law. So what, what was the, who, how this idea arise in their mind to create this digital minister and to ask you to, 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 to to lead this minister? So the question was, how did this idea of radical transparency get into the Taiwanese political culture so that first the KMT during 2015 and then the DPP in 2016 have to work with such a collaborative governance project that I helped create? It was because of some other movement. The movement, the Occupy, is a demonstration but it's not just a protest, it's a demo, a demonstration of radical transparency at work. And so people understand that even with half a million people on the street, and many more online, we can listen at scale and arrive at concrete suggestions and demands and rough consensus that is then legitimized by the head of the parliament. So because of that, people cannot unsee and unlearn that there is actually room for participatory democracy through collaborative governance. And so at the end of 2014, the mayors that advocated for it won. The mayor who advocated against it lost. And that is a clear political signal for everybody. So since you are leading this uh, minister, 
uh, did you see some change, some radical change in a way of making politics in Taiwan? Mm -hmm. Yes. So since I become the digital minister, for example, the control yuan, uh, the branch of the government that takes care of uh, auditing the campaign donation and expense, started publishing in raw data form each individual contributions and expense. They didn't used to do that. They used to do all the auditing by themselves and ask the public to trust them and publish only the statistics and recommendations. But because of the occupiers, one of the core demand is to do away with the black boxes. And many people in the GovZero movement worked with each other to go into the control yuan asking for the photocopies of the individual records, bring them out, scan them into um, computer graphics, use algorithm to divide them into small tofu chunks, and gamified, created a game to render those different images into numbers, like a spreadsheet. So they reverse engineered the control yuan's uh, campaign donation and expense reports. And the control yuan said, well, you can't guarantee that this is 100% correct even though maybe each tofu, each cell has three people looking at it, you can't be 100% sure. And as the civil society says, well then you should publish the raw report so we can work with as investigative journalists and as data scientists. And that's exactly what Controlian has done uh, during the time that I was digital minister. And so this ri rising social norm of anything that has binding power need to be available not only in its conclusion, but at, during its process is very quickly becoming a social norm, not just for the administration, but for the control branch, for the legislative branch, and for the judicial branch. And in the same time, uh, when we talked to uh, some independent journalists, they said the big danger now today is uh, that China controls the information. There is a lot of uh, fact-checking organization, mm -hmm. uh, but in the same way, uh, China tried to disinform people every day. Uh, there is most, uh, uh, more than, uh, uh, they told us, five millions of uh, cyber attacks, cyber attacks mm -hmm. each day. So, in one hand, uh, the democracy is more and more transparent, but in the, uh, the other hand, this democracy became more and more dark because of this uh, cyber attack and disinformation and so on and so on. So, how do you deal with this contradiction? It's not the contradiction, both are true. I don't see the contradiction, I, is it honest? Uh, I mean, I mean, uh, uh, everything became more, uh, become more and more transparent, but mm -hmm. in the same time for the population of Taiwan, mm -hmm. everything become more and more confused, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For confusion and dark. Yes, that's true. Both are true. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, but y if you're asking me to comment on the yes, relationship yes, 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 between those two, yes. right? there's no contradiction, both are true. Right? Um, so, um, about the observation that while this entire policy making process is being a lot more transparent than before and pe making people more informed, there's also actors that try to sow discord in the democratic process, and make people less informed by spreading this information. And both uh, this informed um, deliberations and those uh, disinformation campaigns are a fact in our everyday life. What we know is that for each policy that you helped creating, that you participated and your idea became policy, you become immune or vaccinated against disinformation about that particular policy because you have the whole context and you cannot be provoked into taking kind of a black-white uh, view on things because you understand that there's various different colors, various different sides in this policy-making arena. And so this oversimplification device of provoking outreach that this information relies on no longer affect you on that particular issue. So the more people participate, either in fact-checking and journalism or in creating policies together, the less they would be uh, susceptible to the disinformation interference. Do you think that, because you said that everything, you try to make uh, more transparency, uh, do you think that uh, it can solve two problems, uh, the difference between opinion and emotion, and the problem of identity also? What do you mean by identity? Uh, 
There is a law in Taiwan, la loi sur les, les, pas les immigrés, mais les réfugiés, the refugees uh, law, which is uh, not very clear because uh, we still don't know who is Chinese and who is not Chinese. For example, there is a lot of uh, Hong Kong people. I, I don't think there is a refugee law, though. There was a draft, but... Yeah, it's in Parliament, but people doesn't, like, take care of it. It's Sadly, but, yeah, but it wouldn't cover for Hong Kong people anyway. Yeah, because for people in Hong Kong and Macau, that's a different law. Yeah. Yes, but there was a refugee clause. Yes. A political refugee clause yes. in the Hong Kong uh, and Macau uh, Act. That's already law. What we didn't have is refugee act for non Hong Kong and Macau people. Ah, okay. Okay, uh, and that's because I don't know our kind of natural boundary, you know, is at sea, so. Anyway, so uh, the Hong Kong and Macau clause uh, was indeed applied by a case-by-case -case basis, and people are asking for more clarity. But that is a different thing than this idea of Reg Ref Refugee Act that will apply, again, just to non-Hong Kong and Macau people, uh, and non-PRC people. So these are like two different things. Okay, yeah. so let's talk uh, about the first part of my Okay, question. just first part. Yes, okay. it was okay. uh, the confusion between mm -hmm. opinion and, emo and emotion. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, the idea of listening at scale means that when people feel strongly about something, it is not only the option of acting to destroy people, status, destroy people's reputations, destroy the enemy of uh, your uh, counter camp. That used to be kind of the, the only recourse if you think about things in a black-white binary way. But deliberation means also listening to people who feel differently as you. And really there is no right or wrong about feelings. Around the same shared fact, one can feel happy the other person can feel sad about the same fact, yet they don't dispute that it is an objective fact. And so more transparency that builds these objective facts enable people having the realization that about the same shared facts, there's bound to be different feelings. And so people who feel differently may nevertheless agree on the facts and also on the solutions. It's just they feel differently. And so this kind of polity building is much more inclusive than the kind of binary thinking that says for a any topic, people who don't feel the same as me is automatically the enemy. If you have to define uh, the Taiwanese democracy, it's a young democracy, uh, but do you think that it's, it is one of the most mature democracy in the world because of all those transparency, for example, Chen Shui Bian, who have been elected in 2000, he went to jail uh, for a long time because he received black money. In France, we have generation of politicians. We have a long historical background of democratic uh, democratic background in France, but we have a lot, a lot of politicians who have never seen the face of a judge, uh, even though they receive black money every day. And every day in the newspaper in France, you can find some politician who who are corrupted politicians. So would you say that Taiwan democracy is one of the most mature and mo one of the most real democracy in the world? I would say that our uh, public administration have a very strong code of conduct against corruption. That our contribution to anti-corruption is indeed very strong and that there is a general culture in the public sector that we take pride in being not corrupt. And so that, I think, uh, is one of the most valuable things in the Taiwanese democracy, because that also means that people trust the statistics more, that people trust the numbers, the data that is produced by the public service, because people understand that it's very difficult, it's almost not possible to lobby or to uh, pay dark money, uh, black money to a public servant to get them to change the statistics or the numbers that, that their data system is observing. And that gives confidence in this shared data that is the bedrock of people building a democratic society based on different feelings about the same fact. If people dispute the fact itself, then it makes it much more 
um, impossible, I would say, actually, uh, to build this kind of deliberative democracy. How can you explain that uh, there is in Taiwan a lot of people coming from the civic tech uh, sector working to improve the democracy? Mm -hmm. uh, in the same times, or uh, mm -hmm. I'm taking the French example, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of uh, people coming from uh, the civic tech works for the government to try to twist mm -hmm. a kind of reality here. Mm -hmm. We have the feeling that all these hackers mm -hmm. uh, are working to improve the democracy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So why are there so many pro-social civic hackers uh, yeah. in Taiwan? Two reasons. First, um, as I said, we're the first generation that can really do democracy. Before us, some sort of martial law still lingers, and there is a kind of ceiling of how much your democratic design can go. But now because of our speech freedom, our freedom of um, imagination uh, is very, very strong, so that people find it very rewarding because then your policy design, your mechanism design, has a real effect, not just a constraint fact that could be taken out at the whim of a dictator, benevolent or not, right? So that's first, that it offers real gratification. The second is simply that we have less legacy. While uh, people who want to make changes to the public administration in uh, established European republics must first understand why it came the way it is through the various republics and the uh, norms and habits and the uh, historical nuances that built this public administration system. There's simply less of that in Taiwan. So even people who are somewhat naive uh, about politics can go in and only take a year or two and they understand all there is to understand to the democratic process because it's so new. There's less to learn about and then they can start making innovations. Don't you think that, uh, because nowadays we are, uh, we are talking a lot about uh, artificial intelligence, um, do you think that uh, uh, the fact that uh, artificial intelligence, uh, do, don't you think that to say that artificial intelligence can bring everything and to solve everything is not uh, uh, a little bit naive to believe that? Certainly, artificial intelligence, um, as it's defined, simply means, well, automation. That seems like something that people can do and now machine can also do. It is certainly not a um, uh, god of the machine uh, that can automatically solve any plot uh, issues. Uh, we are not living in a Greek drama, uh, and so that is not uh, what my perception of artificial intelligence is. No. So, what is your perception? Well, it's just a general term to describe a certain kind of uh, computers uh, that can somehow automate away uh, what used to be uh, people's work. Uh, for example, it used to be that only people can compute numbers, like calculations. Uh, so computers were describing people, but then general purpose calculators with programmable um, software uh, appeared. And now when we say computer, it means machine, not people. Or for example, printers used to be people who work with the movable type uh, to make uh, the uh, tablets uh, for printing. And that's very valuable work, uh, in fact, powered the entire enlightenment. However, um, now when we say printer, we don't think about people anymore. We think about a machine. So these are also intelligences uh, of printers and computers of the previous generations that are being put into artifacts. And now we use those printers and computers, our calculators, uh, without thinking twice that there were people performing these tasks. But it doesn't mean that these people are out of the job. There are still data scientists that makes use of computers to compute and direct the creative direction. There are still uh, journalists that make use of the printers uh, to print whatever they want to print there and disseminate ideas uh, in a timely fashion. So it is not that the work of journalism or the work of data science is going away, or statistics is going away. It is simply that the boring and trivial part of their uh, tasks is being automated by artificial components.
So you, you, uh, you create V Taiwan for virtu virtual Taiwan. Well, mm -hmm. well co-created, but yes. yes. Mm -hmm. can, can you explain mm -hmm. what is virtual Taiwan? Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, back in um, late 2014, um, Minister uh, Jacqueline Tsai at the time uh, attended a Gov Zero hackathon and bringing with her uh, two policy questions. First is that how do we regulate teleworking? There's no union for teleworkers. How do we regulate teleworking? And the second is that there's a lot of startups that are founded on Cayman Islands uh, but not registered in Taiwan, even though they're all Taiwanese people operating in Taiwan. Why do they do that? And can we change the company act so that less people register at Cayman Islands and more people register at Taiwan? So these two questions uh, are not easily answered by traditional ways of policy making, simply because there's no representative of either teleworkers or people who register their startup at Cayman Islands. There's no form of assemblies or collectives or association that you can simply ask them to send a representative to negotiate. Right? So because of that, when she proposed this uh, question, uh, a lot of GovZero uh, volunteers, uh, including me, I just start drawing on this whiteboard a possible way to reach out to those stakeholders via digital means so that they can express their voices that can map out the problem space so that we can meet through face-to-face -face consultations to find out what may be the common issue that they are all facing and that became the V-Taiwan process. Are you afraid of uh, of the fact that uh, if everything becomes virtual and if uh, you, you create uh, uh, new uh, digital tools uh, to improve uh, the, the the democracy, uh, don't you think that the risk is to be too far away from the daily life of the people in the street? So the question is that if if everything becomes too virtual and if everything becomes digital, don't you think that it can create a gap between? Uh, what you are trying to do in in, for, uh, in this minister and the reality of the daily life people. People on the street, yeah. People on the street, they use mobile phones, so... I mean, when they're on the street, so they're still connected to the internet. I'm not sure what the question is trying to portray. Like, like are there places in Taiwan where the um, phone doesn't have a reception? And what about people who don't have a phone reception and they would be excluded from democracy? Is that the, the question? Okay. So um, the question about if we make our documents online and we make our participation in online spaces, what about people who don't have a connection to the internet? Or if people only have very limited bandwidth and we put so much data online so that without broadband they cannot really watch a live stream. So whatever we're live streaming doesn't quite reach these people. So are we excluding them from democracy? That was a question. And the answer simply is that broadband is human right in Taiwan. Uh, if there's any place in Taiwan that doesn't have a broadband... Ex uh, sorry, let's do this again. So the question was about what about people who don't have internet access or broadband so that whatever we put online is unavailable to these people? Are we not excluding them from democracy? To this I have two answers. First, we bring those consultations to people. We're not asking people to come only for online discussions. We're using online discussions to inform the agenda for face-to-face -face conversations in people's vicinity. So we're not replacing town halls, we're augmenting town halls. And the second is that for people who live in places where there is no uh, mobile phone reception or landlines or any kind of broadband access, that's our fault. Broadband is a human right in Taiwan. So now even at the most indigenous and rural and mountainous places, there is broadband connection. 
um, the remaining 2% or so, many of them above 3,000 uh, meters high, uh, the Ministry of Interior is currently also using helicopters to ensure complete coverage. And so to us, we take broadband human rights very seriously because it's not just a right to access, it is also a right to participate. Yes, but even though they, even though they have access uh, to internet, uh, uh, when you see the, the statistics, uh, there is not a lot of people who are going to see uh, what is in free access on internet. So how can you educate all those people uh, to go to see, to participate, mm -hmm. because now uh, uh, the statistics show that there is not a lot of, there is, it's not the majority of the Taiwanese people who use those new digital tools to participate to the, this transparent democratic uh, way of living. So the question is that even though our participation platform joined GOVTW has more than 10 million visitors, that in fact is not a majority for Taiwan with 23 million people, slightly under half. The answer of course is we need to make it more popular, but it's not just asking people to come to our platform, it's also bringing the conversation to the people. And that is why people like Brian, uh, people in the Unstoppable Happy Party, is so important, because they can take a trending controversial issue, maybe one of the petitions that's going on, in the joint platform and package it in a way that resembles a entertaining show and reaches more people so that people would be more willing to understand the political context between uh, the people who are pro and people who are against that particular conversation. And so when more and more people remix these transparent products into uh, various other messages that appeals to different segments of people, that makes us more inclusive. For our publications cannot be uh, accommodating to all the different neurodiversity, cultural diversity, linguistic diversity, no matter how we try, there's bound to be some gaps that we did not anticipate. And if we allow everybody to make remix our work through choosing open licenses and making sure that they are not hindered by copyright and things like that, people can remix those messages to cater for their own community and that increase the reach. So we don't have to be the only people that uh, caters to the publication uh, preferences of people. Rather, there could be any number of intermediaries that remixes the message and make uh, appealing uh, shows or appealing artifacts out of it. So let's talk uh, about uh, the Chinese shadow who seems to be uh, always on Taiwan. Uh, for example, uh, the young generation of people. We we went to uh, uh, an agency to, to a what? Uh, um, oh, the headhunter agency. Headhunter agency, and he told us that a lot of young people want to go to work in China uh, because uh, China offered them more and more opportunity and better opportunity that, than in Taiwan. So uh, uh, there is also self-censorship. Those people that don't want to, to talk freely about, uh, about, about, about China, uh, do you think that it's a real danger, this, uh, how to, to avoid, how to, to make this shadow go away from, from Taiwan? The question of China. Because China is say, yeah, Taiwanese people say, oh, you know, our most uh, important problem is China. I still don't quite understand the question. The this question is, is how to, to, mm -hmm. to make uh, Taiwanese people understand that they have to, uh, they don't have to be afraid anymore about these Chinese issues. Uh -huh. Right. So the question was how to make people understand that even though that PRC uh, indeed has a lot of economic ties um, with not only Taiwan but everybody else, uh, that their way of living, which currently is much more authoritarian than our preference, uh, will not in fact uh, be the dominant one in Taiwan anytime soon, right? That, that was the question. Yeah. Um, I think uh, people really made that message very loud and clear during the Hong Kong protests. Uh, when we see the Hong Kong anti-ELAP movement 
everybody in Taiwan, including actually both leading presidential candidates at the time, supported the Hong Kong people to fight for democracy and for general election as well, which is exactly what Taiwan went through from the 80s to the 90s. Uh, and so there is no controversy in Taiwan during the presidential election that the Hong Kong people deserve what Taiwan has earned in the 80s and 90s. And so I think this serves as a constant reminder that authoritarianism uh, is very close, it's in our proximity. However, the real progress about countering authoritarianism is in fact happening. And in fact that Taiwan as a liberal democracy is strong enough to support people everywhere in the world who want to advance democracy. So that builds the kind of self-confidence that can let people look at authoritarianism and clearly say that this is not our preferred lifestyle. And I think during the course of this presidential election, a lot more people, especially young people, built a very strong resilience against this kind of authoritarianism propaganda that democracy doesn't work or whatever. Yes, but uh, we have the feeling that uh, uh, saying when won the last election in 2020 because of what happened in Hong Kong. Uh, because when that was one of the factors, sure. Because when you see the pools, uh, mm -hmm. the statistics uh, six months ago, uh, nobody could say that she will win the election. So uh, it was a tie uh, back yeah. in June. Yeah. Uh, so uh, is it because? Uh, what happened in Hong Kong, and is it because of what Xi Jinping said about Taiwan that Tsai Ing-wen won the election? So, um, about uh, the June uh, protest, I actually also tweeted uh, about it um, in the uh, June 16 uh, movement. And uh, I think people really agreed with the general sentiment that this is the chance that the PRC can show that they uh, if they say, they also public say, that they commit to revise their governance for better governance and a justice in institutions. Uh, but the, their uh, poor implementation of the right to justice is in fact the root of the anti elect movement. If they have a court system that is even more just and respected than the Hong Kong court system, of course people would not be that angry about extradition, right? So because of that, it shows that they have a way to go when it comes to the public trust in the court system. And so they, of course, need to work on improving that instead of you know, telling the Hong Kong people that they shouldn't protest about the lack of uh, judicial accountability and transparency in the PRC. And so people making this kind of arguments are being supported uh, by pretty much everybody uh, in Taiwan. And it is true that Dr. Tsai made such statements before her other opponents in the presidential race, but eventually all the other presidential candidates made very similar supportive arguments, but many of them made this so only months after the anti elect protest. So I wouldn't say that the Hong Kong protest gave anyone an advantage. I'm just saying that people who make such a standing clear the earlier, the more advantage they get from popular support, because everybody in Taiwan is supporting that. Do you think that uh, what happened in Hong Kong uh, since June uh, have the, is the same uh, uh, provoke uh, the same consciousness uh, issues? No, you want to this question? I don't want to ask this question. Ce qui s'est passé à Hong Kong a provoqué euh, finalement une prise de conscience, comme le, le Sunflower Movement avait provoqué une prise de conscience dans la population taïwanaise. Ah, Est-ce que ce qui arrive à Hong, à Hong Kong provoque les Taïwanais comme le mouvement Comme à l'époque, oui. Il a dit que les Hong Kong ont fait une prise de conscience, 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 une prise de conscience. So the question is whether the anti elect movement carries similarities in terms of engagement strategies with young people with the Sunflower Movement. Okay. Um, in the Sunflower Movement, uh, there is indeed this kind of polycentric uh, organizations. Um, let's do this again. 
So for the question about the similarities of the anti-E lab vis-à-vis uh, -vis Sunflower movement when it comes to engagement strategies of organizers of the movement, um, Sunflower movement was initiated by around 20 NGOs each caring about a different aspect of the CSSTA. So it was kind of a coalition. So it is not leaderless per se. There are exactly like 20, 25 leaders, uh, each being a NGO. Uh, because of that, uh, this coalition uh, think about some commonalities, but each participant in this coalition, each NGO, also focus on something like very unique to that particular NGO when organizing uh, the Occupy movement. But in Hong Kong, we can easily see that there are countless leaders. Like anyone can be a leader and start writing, say, May Glory Be to Hong Kong uh, on LIHKG and suddenly get a lot of people volunteering uh, to sing in chorus and to remix those um, um, ideas uh, in various different languages and so on. We see some of that during Sunflower, but still uh, we can count the number of leaders. But in Hong Kong, in entirely e-lab, it's countless. And so because of that, it's not leaderless. It's like everybody can become a leader very quickly by educating themselves about the way of organizing the protest. And so I think they have a much f wider and deeper reach into the uh, people who are young and also people who are old who really want to get into this protest and that they reached far more people around the world than the Sunflower Movement. But uh, they have certain resemblances in a sense of using digital tools to coordinate as the Sunflower Movement. But I think they went much further. Thank you very much. I've got uh, other question, but uh, with your virtual uh, mm -hmm. double. Okay. So. <coughs> Uh, why are you? So why are you using uh, VR or mask? Because uh, the first time when when we met, you said to me that uh, it was when you want to rest, when you want to go away and uh, brief uh, somewhere else, you take your VR mask uh, to go in the spin, in in the space. space. Can okay. you explain to me? Um, sure. Um, the reason why I choose to use uh, Star Chart VR, which is a educational tool uh, to make the viewer uh, step out of the Earth and look at the Earth from the vantage point of the space and the other planets in their accurate position uh, now, is that making virtual reality not about something fictional, but rather about the real position of the celestial bodies within the solar system. And so, to me, it makes the idea of a body of politics uh, more clear if you are viewing from space, because you don't see the jurisdictional boundaries. You don't see most of the um, features of civilization other than the lights. And that view, the overview of Earth as a body, as a celestial body, uh, is instrumental when thinking about global multi-stakeholder issues. Uh, if I want to talk about internet governance, if I want to talk about this emerging machine intelligence, if I want to talk about the effects of 5G network on the planet, uh, climate action certainly, um, have a vantage point outside of the Earth can remove a lot of the cloud that clouds our thought patterns simply because we cannot easily imagine what is it like to be in the other part of the planet because the clouds shields our eyesight so that we can only look at our vicinity which is a small part of the Earth. So Earth as a complete body, um, if you view it from space, it removes a lot of uh, the thought patterns and habits that clouds one's judgments. And so that's why I choose uh, that as kind of my, one of my relaxing um, practices. But you are going there alone or with, uh, sometimes you, you bring friends with you? 
Hmm. Yeah, it, it could be arranged in a virtual meeting uh, for sure. But mostly, I go there alone and listen to some music and things like that. What what what, uh, what do you think? Uh, what what is your thinking when you are upstairs? But I mean, in the space. Hmm. So um, when I'm in the space and floating, um, like between different celestial bodies, uh, not only me, but pretty much everyone who I invited into the space uh, instinctively look back to Earth, no matter where in the solar system you are. For Earth is um, the cradle of civilization, uh, human civilization, I mean, uh, and it shows that how fragile and how um, um, unique it is uh, in the solar system, at least. And so people become more pro-social and care for each other more uh, because the artificial boundaries, you don't see it from space, but this unity and the strength and fragility of our shared planet uh, is much more tangible when you're in space. So that's the kind of thought I have. Okay. Uh, a few more questions because we don't know how we are going to use uh, mm -hmm. the footage. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Um, why? Why it was important for you to to go to the night night show with Brian? So um, my main uh, idea is to make pedagogy. Uh, I would like people to understand that the work that I'm doing, which is radical transparency, um, has certain similarities of the work that Brian is doing, where I'm trying to, in a digital minister's position, make everything that I chaired publicly available. What he is trying to do is to get prominent politicians in a context of a conversation uh, to make apparent their agenda and their ideas and their goals and things like that in a way that is accessible uh, to everybody, not just people who are interested in politics. And so I would like to talk to Brian, not only about the policies that I helped making, but also try to show why such a mimetic, engineered, uh, like humorous take on politics is important to build a polity that can engage in diverse cultures instead of kind of a monoculture of just right or wrong, yes and no, and black and white, and things like that. So I would like to uh, contribute to this kind of thing. At the beginning, uh, almost at the beginning of the conversation, you said that uh, you are creating uh, digital tools not only uh, to uh, uh, put everything in, stream in streaming, but at the same time, each time when I come to see you, uh, mm -hmm. You film uh, our conversation, mm -hmm. and you are filming every conversation. It's not, com it's, it's not live streaming, though. No, yes, but uh, mm -hmm. you are going to put it on the on on, on your uh, uh, on, yeah on, on our website. Uh, on your website, mm -hmm. why is it important for you to uh, uh, to show uh, to the public uh, my face or the cameraman mm -hmm. uh, our conversation? Mm -hmm. Because that's what I see. Like, um, the reason why I want to contextualize this conversation instead of people who are watching this film right now uh, probably only see my head talking and not understanding that you are nodding all the time to me. Uh, it is important <laughs> to show uh, that uh, where I am looking at the world is nothing unique. Anyone who are accessing the same information that I'm accessing can potentially think of even more innovative ways. So instead of just monopolizing 
the information offered to a minister uh, when we're chairing a meeting, uh, and instead making clear the context so that people can reenact this context and think what I would do if I'm the digital minister currently being interviewed by Elaine, um, what would I say, and things like that. And because of that, of the contextualization, people can become much more prepared when they do perform political actions. And so it takes away a lot of the uh, mystification uh, when it comes to the work of a career politician. It's a way to demystify the politician of. work. Yeah. And why is it important to demystify? So that everybody can participate. For example, uh, if uh, uh, you put on your website our conversation, how the people can participate with us? They can also think that the question you ask me, if there is a more appropriate, according to them, version, or whether the same idea may be put in a more eloquent way, or whether I um, omitted or missed certain part of people, when I say everybody supports, uh, the right of Hong Kong people uh, to enjoy the promised self-governing to them. Maybe I'm missing some people, leaving some people behind. Maybe some people don't think so. And these people can certainly let me know that I'm not representing them, and so on. So it enables a kind of um, peer-to-peer conversation around the same social object. People stop being you know, just the watchers of the film and their only engagement is to rate it one star or five star on Netflix or somewhere else. But rather, they can just write me and say, when you're answering Elaine's question in this context, I think you should have said this instead. If it were me, I would put it differently, and so on. But if they only look at the um, edited and cut version, where it's mostly me speaking without this whole conversational context, they cannot be as informed as they are if they look at the whole context. Um. On va parler quand même du de son double digital assis et après on fait des choses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, alors attendez, je ne vais pas passer là. Sorry. Est-ce que tu peux aussi utiliser des archives à, à l'ONU tout ça Oui. Why did you uh, decide to create a digital double of you, of yourself mm -hmm. So, uh, if you refer to the 3D scan avatar, uh, in the virtual reality? No, Instead your... Uh, uh, digital double? Yes. Yeah, but um, you mean which incarnation? Because uh, I have many incarnations. One is the actual 3D scan model of myself that can walk and talk in virtual reality. Uh, one is simply a kind of uh, Skype uh, projected through an iPad, sometimes attached to a robotic body, sometimes just snap to one of the chairs. Um, I, I don't really know uh, which one you're referring to or which scenario you're so referring to. Why did you create so many double of yourself? <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so the reason why uh, I create a lot of technologies that enable what we call telepresence, uh, meaning that being present at some place while physically being elsewhere, uh, is out of practicality. I get invited to speech and uh, forums and summits uh, all over the world. And if I keep doing air travel, uh, first it will have an impact on climate change, but also uh, it will make the jet lag uh, perennial uh, for me. Uh, and so it's not practical for me to fly to each occasion where I need to uh, engage in conversations. But if they can use uh, inexpensive equipment such as uh, a holographic two-dimensional gauze projection uh, or um, some sort of telepresence robot uh, or some sort of um, just an iPad but snapping on a chair and they can rotate the chair, uh, it can enable me to participate in meetings uh, without having to fly all over the world. So at the beginning, it is just a way for practical uh, jet lag uh, avoidance, as well as reducing carbon emission. Uh, you said that uh, internationalism in the 21st century uh, is the internet. Does it mean that uh, the question of uh, the recognition, the recon recognition, the recognition of Taiwan, uh -huh. uh, is not anymore an issue? Mm -hmm. So the question was, uh, on the internet, does the fact 
the Taiwan websites ends in .tw, and anywhere in the world, including in PRC territories, if you type something .tw, it goes to the Taiwan uh, to the Taiwan um, domain name service, uh, and it correctly responds uh, within the governance of Taiwanese people. Uh, is that a kind of international recognition? And I would say yes, definitely. Uh, that the dot tw uh, is actually the domain name that I print on my name card, and that is the only domain uh, instead of the name of any country or whatever. I just wrote my email address um, and also the website p this dot tw uh, on it. Uh, to me, that is the main space of international uh, negotiation. But that's because I'm digital minister. I'm not pretending that for other ministers, they don't have international recognition challenges. I'm just saying that on the internet governance uh, issue, we don't see any trend of kind of canceling that TW from the internet. That's not happening. So with your digital uh, different uh, doubles, you can cross the border, you can go everywhere you want to go, you can discuss with everyone. That has internet connection, broadband. Yes. <laughs> yes. So can you say that? that uh, yes. You don't need any passport, yes. you don't need any visa? Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, anywhere that has broadband connection, um, I can send my digital double to. And I have done so uh, repeatedly uh, in many, say, UN venues or uh, various different uh, multilateral organizations and uh, high level meetings and so on. Um, because mostly um, the jurisdictional control uh, occurs at passport control, but a robot does not need a passport. And because of that, my robotic double can go anywhere that has a broadband connection. And as long as I have a secure communication link, to that robot, that robot uh, cannot represent me. It can represent me uh, from anywhere in the world to anywhere in the world. What do you think of uh, those uh, democratic country like France, like European country or America, uh, America or Australia, who doesn't, who don't, don't want to recognize Taiwan because they're afraid of, of losing their business with China? Um, the question was about uh, the countries such as the U.S. and other countries. Why are they democratic not democratic country? Uh, sorry, the question was about other liberal democratic countries such as the U.S. and other countries uh, that does not uh, recognize Taiwan. Uh, but in fact, U.S. does. Uh, that's the Taiwan Relation Act or the TRA. The TRA and its subsequent acts gives, uh, for example, the AIT, the de facto embassy, a uh, very similar status. And in fact, it's uh, a real embassy in all but name, uh, in its functions and in its uh, dispatch and things like that. Of course, we now also have the Taiwan Travel Act and various other acts that enable regular visits of high-level officials and things like that, uh, with DC and to DC and from and things like that. So it is obviously possible to build a relationship with Taiwan. Uh, you just have to think creatively. Mm -hmm. But the fact that they don't want to, to say that officially, for example, in Paris there is no Taiwanese embassy, there is only an office, a representative office, but uh, the, the people who are ruling this office are not ambassadors. They are ambassadors. No? According to our legal system. Ah. Mm. But not according to French uh, diplomacy. Mm -hmm. no. So how can you explain this hypocrite attitude? Um, it's not my role to um, comment upon other jurisdictions' attitude. What I'm trying to say is that for some years now, all the um, TECRO, uh, Taiwan Economic Cultural Office, uh, representatives are ambassadors according to our foreign service and so we're not being uh, hypocritical here uh, we call them ambassadors they are our ambassadors whether our ambassadors is uh, recognized as ambassadors uh, depends of course by the people they interact with uh, in many jurisdictions, when our ambassadors uh, deliver uh, their communications and their missions, uh, especially for the civil society and the industrial sector, they uh, treat our ambassadors as ambassadors. It is only perhaps um, the um, Korea Public Office working in foreign service in various other jurisdictions that have this concern of calling our ambassadors ambassadors. But the civil society and the cultural industrial sectors have long since recognized our ambassadors as ambassadors. 
So y y you are the one who, who try to spread the open culture in Taiwan mm -hmm. and all over the world. One of the ones, but yes. Yeah. Uh, what about OGP? OGP mm -hmm. should recognize Taiwan, but Taiwan has mm -hmm. twice to, mm -hmm. to, be, to, to belong to OGP, and mm -hmm. OGP said no. Mm -hmm. so how can you yeah. explain well, that? Well, OGP actually have already agreed to partner with Taiwan. So uh, we are, in fact, making the National Action Plan uh, as we speak. And we will uh, likely produce one uh, sometime around May, which is the inauguration day of Tsai Ing-wen's uh, second term. Uh, and so unlike other OGP member countries who make two-year National Action Plans, Taiwan makes four-year National Action Plan that aligns exactly with the second term of Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, so that we improve on the democratic process of OGP itself by making sure that we don't run uh, afoul of the usual uh, problem of the two-year action plan, the second of which sometimes fall between two presidents and the uh, um, incoming president uh, is then held also to the promises of the uh, previous president uh, that creates a kind of political issue. But for our NAP, that's going to be exactly the same as the second term of Dr. Tsai Ing-wen. So there is no disconnect between our NAP and her campaign promises about open government and we think is a better system. And so we forked the uh, OGP uh, offering a better process and partnering with the OGP and calling ourselves the Open Government Taiwan National Action Plan and other OGP member countries may actually learn from us and maybe merge back this process. So we are in close partnership and this kind of um, affiliate or partnership status instead of a member status actually offered us more liberty at innovating on the core processes of the OGP while adhering to the OGP process and the manual. And one uh, little precision: when you say uh, when you are the when you want to spread the open culture, mm -hmm. um, what do you mean? You mean uh, to open all the the data from the government to the people, or mm -hmm. also the data of the people? When I'm saying that I would like to op make an open government. I mean to make the government proceedings transparent to the people, sometimes through open government data, sometimes through participatory processes, sometimes through accountable institutions, for example, the Control Yuan uh, improvement. Uh, and all this makes the state apparatus much more accessible and transparent to the people. And certainly we're not saying that the people should be transparent to the state, which would be surveillance. Is there a, a, a red line that you, you can't cross? Mm -hmm. So um, the question about is there a limit to make the state apparatus uh, transparent? Because you were talking about totalitarian... Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question about the kind of boundary of making uh, the government proceedings open, of course it should be uh, protecting the privacy of the people involved because we are in this for work. It is uh, not about making uh, comments on ourselves and our private um, endeavors and, and our private time, right? So we only make public the meetings that are official meetings. I'm certainly not publishing uh, the menu of every dinner that I uh, had. Uh, it has nothing to do with the work, right? So this is that. And of course, uh, national secrets, um, confidential um, documents and so on have their own rule. Some of them need to be declassified after 10 years, some 20, some 30 years. And of course, open government uh, needs to stop at those uh, national secrets that were classified for uh, various reasons. So there need to be kind of embargo. And of course, there's also the concern of the public benefit. For example, there was a data set that people really wanted, uh, which is uh, the uh, release of the frozen um, like cabbage or some kind of uh, vegetables uh, in uh, readiness to a shortage of supply to make uh, more accessible the agri products that people rely on. And so it serves to balance the price uh, of the market. Now this uh, amount of release every day to the market is actually uh, kept confidential because if you can predict the release of the amount uh, way before they uh, get released to the market, 
that actually doesn't help to fight speculation. <laughs> the speculator <laughs> would have perfect information uh, to continue to speculate, right? And, and so that is kind of like a trade secret uh, of the government uh, in the uh, Council of Agriculture. But when we ask them uh, how soon after the release of that into the market can you uh, publish the data because they were withholding everything. And I'm saying, you know, even national secrets, you declassify it usually after a decade or two. So certainly there is a time, a, a delta time, that you can tell me after this amount of time, this is no longer sensitive to the market fluctuation and you can provide it for people in raw data form. And they held some meetings and go back and told me, Minister, we can release it after 24 hours. Because after one trading cycle, it has no uh, amount of uh, influence on the next day's price uh, they determined. So we set up an open data plan that released it after 24 hours. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So just when you not, when you, uh, without speaking, and you, you can look at this. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Security perimeter. That, of course, uh, takes a little bit more time and expensive uh, in the kind of front-loading the expense. But on the other hand, if you do accept PRC components in your core network, you're going to have to run security audits anyway. And so that is like a mortised expense. And whether the cost-benefit um, scenario makes sense for each telecom companies, as well as for the citizens that they serve, again, that is uh, their own assessment. What we're trying to provide is just some uh, real facts uh, in our experience. We're certainly not saying that these calculations are the same universal. Mm. Et comment on fait pour rendre cette technologie compétitive par rapport à, à celle des Chinois? Well, first of all, uh, in certain areas, for example, in semiconductor manufacturing, uh, we still have a healthy lead of um, easily nearly a decade uh, ahead uh, of PRC. Uh, and there's many uh, what they call dual-use uh, technologies that the PRC currently don't have easy access to, uh, which is why um, there's alleged um, efforts to um, exit this uh, through non-market means. Uh, but all these, I think, uh, is no match uh, to just setting up a core um, innovation uh, value in the society so that people would uh, very much like to innovate on the cutting edge technologies uh, that serves the common good, that serves the good of the not just the um, profit-seeking shareholders, but all the society's stakeholders. And Taiwan has no shortage of the leading uh, machine learning researchers and communication researchers and so on that works towards that. So I'm um, quite optimistic when it comes to making up a innovative uh, landscape. What I'm uh, trying to say here is that um, sometimes it's not a linear competition uh, between like who deploys the most number of 5G stations first. Equally important is where you are strategically placing those early adoptions of 5G sites. Are you only benefiting certain people in the core municipality of your capital or are you enabling previously um, uh, unheard of solutions that is needed, for example, uh, to enable telemedicine for the least uh, privileged people in a rural place uh, or to enable uh, novel forms of social collaboration in the uh, lands that uh, where uh, people who are of a indigenous culture uh, want to revitalize their culture and could rely on 5G for co-presencing uh, so that people can experience their culture together and so on. So all these cultural and social values are what is needed to make the 5G innovations uh, that involve the whole society instead of just a few researchers and that is why we have dedicated uh, sandbox plans for dedicated spectrums for the issues that pertains to the local use case, not just the large municipalities. So you, you say to the world that uh, they have to be confident and that they, have, they don't have to be afraid of Chinese technology. Well, my main message, wh wherever it's disinformation or whatever, uh, is don't panic. Because if you're in a panic, especially moral panic, uh, it actually makes innovation harder to happen. Because innovation requires uh, the kind of entertaining various different possible solutions. But uh, in a panic state, people seek for the fastest solution, which may or may not be the best one, uh, over a, even a medium term. So let's talk about uh, your uh, double. Um, Hi. Y y you are the only one to do that, or did you meet uh, other double? In mm -hmm. 
did you make already other, other doubles or are you the only one who do that? Mm, you mean other ministers or uh, anybody? Yeah, uh, uh, other minister. Huh, we, we, I was part of the Virtual Island Summit, uh, which is, um, I think, started by a few uh, Caribbean uh, island uh, countries that want to talk about climate change and sustainability for islands. Uh, and because a lot of it came from the climate change and action uh, world, uh, we don't want to um, have more CO2 emissions by running such a summit. So everybody is a digital uh, double uh, in that summit, but we still have the same schedule. We have the same like ministerial participation, the opening remark, just like a real summit, but everything is virtual. So we can say uh, with our conscience that running this uh, summit uh, with participants from me, from Taiwan, and also someone from the Pescador, from the Penghu Island, which is its own island, uh, uh, contribute uh, almost nothing uh, to the carbon emission. Because we imagine that uh, you did that for the first time because you couldn't go to the UN, for example. No, no, not at all. That was just a time where the press discovered it because the UN IGF was live streamed. But I did that routinely. Uh, and uh, even way before uh, that uh, Geneva meeting, uh, we did that. Uh, even domestically, I uh, used the 360 robot to visit the south uh, uh, site of the National Palace Museum uh, to tour a kind of uh, Japanese um, exhibition uh, of the, the national treasures. Uh, and then I talked with the head of the, the head curator of National Palace Museum and a lot of people kind of piggybacking because they watched the 360 live stream with my robot walking, uh, typing questions. So I kind of moderated their questions and asked the chief curator. And so we've used that um, very routinely, I would say, uh, for quite some time before the press uh, discovered it uh, because of the IGF Geneva meeting. What was the reaction of uh, is, of the Chinese people, for example, who refused that the world listen to Taiwan? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I mean, there's nothing against the UN rules for you know playing a movie, and this is just playing a movie, even though it's recorded maybe you know 500 milliseconds ago, it's still a movie. Uh, and so, because of that, I've made uh, a, a lot of. Uh, impressions uh, to the UN related places that we're just talking about the sustainable development goals. We're just, you know, talking about policies, not really politics, uh, and we always stay on topic. Um, and so the PRC, uh, of course, according to their interpretation of a certain UN resolution, uh, they cannot coexist uh, with a Taiwan representative in the same room, in the same meeting. But as you can see during the uh, IGF Geneva live stream, even though they tried to protest, uh, the uh, chair uh, said no to the protester, but they did not leave the room. And, and that means that they don't classify uh, this robot uh, as a kind of human ambassador. Uh, which would require their uh, leaving the room if uh, they cannot remove me from the room. Uh, and so they um, may not be that um, happy, but they coexist uh, in the same room with my robotic double. Yes, because it's not just a movie, it's the voice of Taiwan. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which is what you're making, I guess? It's a comment. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. Alright. We're good? Thank you. Can you introduce me this new avatar? This is the, the oldest one actually. Uh, we, we, we scanned this in France uh, and we went to a uh, 3D scanning studio uh, where they used a lot of cameras uh, in a kind of cylinder uh, and captured uh, me in two poses. And that's one of the poses, uh, and that's the main one uh, that when I was in Paris, uh, I talked uh, with people like primary and secondary high school uh, people uh, in this uh, avatar form and shrinking this avatar to the same height as the young people uh, in virtual reality. So they don't have to look up to me. They can feel that I am uh, the same height as them uh, as to enable a kind of more equal uh, conversation. And that's one of the very early experiments uh, in setting up a more uh, deliberative uh, scale uh, in the virtual reality. Uh, we also made um, another uh, scan, which is less used, uh, that is uh, around the same time, uh, which is me, but uh, less sci-fi, I guess, uh, and wearing a Coast Cup uh, shirt, I think. It's 
make something as you wish uh, in Taiwan. Uh, okay. So uh, uh, how do you use this avatar? So we use a virtual reality platform called uh, High Fidelity. Uh, in the high fidelity world, we can make those avatars uh, move uh, by using those um, controllers. So if I move uh, in the real world, it's like a um, cheap motion capture device. So they uh, figure out where my head is turning and where my hands are and make the avatar in the virtual reality do the same movement. Uh, and this is um, even better if you only have 3G connection uh, because they don't have to transmit my image, only uh, the uh, place uh, in the space of my um, ankles. Uh, and that uh, enables a faithful recreation uh, of my uh, movement in the virtual reality space, which can then be projected as hologram or something uh, in another physical space. It's uh, again a way to be anywhere in the world. Exactly. Yeah. To to uh, make co-presence uh, when there previously require a lot of arrangement travel. And in the same time, you can be all over the world in the same time. That's right. Yes. Okay. Can you uh, move again the first one? Okay. show you um, the kind of base model mm -hmm. where it's made of. As you can see, it was uh, more rough uh, and the polygons uh, don't look as good as the polished one. So we did some cosmetics uh, in uh, virtual reality and put on a sunglass and, and so on and uh, did my hair. But unlike the cosmetician, uh, the makeup artist we work with, I don't have to do it every time I appear on the show. I only do it once. Uh, and then the um, uh, better model uh, can be reused. Uh, so it's also, I guess, more uh, environmental friendly. So that's the kind of polished model that I use. Okay? All right. Now, do I put on this? Yes. Okay. Okay, I suppose you can see what I see? Yes.
I remember visiting Addis Ababa uh, and uh, a lot of my colleagues uh, went to a museum uh, to see Lucy, uh, which is a uh, kind of um, ancient uh, fossil uh, record that helps establishing the uh, East and North uh, Africa as one of the origins of, uh, of the modern humanity of Homo sapiens. Uh, this is the so-called out of Africa uh, hypothesis, uh, and as you can see, a lot of the human-made structures are simply not visible. Uh, when you are viewing this, uh, you will instead only have an idea of the population uh, based on the kind of lights uh, that they uh, offer, uh, and uh, and that's just Earth we're talking about. So maybe it's not just Earth. Uh, there are also other places. Uh, this is Hong Kong. Uh, and um, we can also see many other cities uh, around here right, in the world. Uh, and for many people, um, there's um, like here is Taipei. Um, for many people, if they look at the sun, uh, they cannot directly uh, look at the sun. They will uh, have to wear sunglasses. Uh, but because the star chart is uh, protected against uh, radiation, and I'm sure, <laughs> you can easily hold the sun. <laughs> and uh, look at it uh, without hurting your eyes uh, and then you can actually travel outside of the solar system uh, and look at the configuration uh, as it currently is for the solar system and there's also many other constellations uh, around us and if you truly want uh, you can also like this is various other uh, planets uh, and uh, you may also look at its basic properties and make a travel uh, between the celestial bodies and that is Mars and it can also show the constellations uh, as the people imagined them uh, by painting the configurations of stars and overlaying it uh, with a kind of mythical figure or object that um, they try to uh, assign meaning uh, to this formation of the stars and that is the Mars and two of its satellites um, as they look now and we can go to Mars. So thanks to the spirit and curiosity um, rovers, uh, we now have a pretty good view of Mars uh, as is, uh, and there's various um, interesting features uh, around here. So, um, are you okay with, with this? Should we look at something else? Or? Um, can you just, during one minute, uh, listen to uh, music like you uh -huh. you do be, uh, sometimes when you take a rest with me? Yeah, there's actually already music playing. It's ah. just not playing out. Okay. So I, I don't know how you are going to, to so, make uh, this. Maybe or look, maybe look I at some, the earth or something without speaking. Okay, just okay.
as well to put full screen for us. Full uh, screen. Thank you. So now this is looking at the earth uh, from the sun. So we're probably, that's all there is to see. Do you still need other scenarios? Can you, can, can you go closer to, to Taiwan and Hong Kong? Okay, okay, okay. Please. Okay. Is this what you want? I'm not sure whether why it's showing Singapore, but I guess it decides to show it anyway. Is it possible to go closer than than this? Of course, I'll have to stand up, like physically, <laughs> go closer. Um, I think it's that's the limit. Um, okay. Okay. Okay, yay, we're done.